Well, this is the San Diego Investment Club. I definitely appreciate you guys coming out here. My name is Daryl Kukan, and uh, my business partner and I, we have a company called Kukan and Clark Partners. We're fix and flip investors, we're buy and hold investors, and we're in the middle of uh, developing our first uh, residential property. So, with that said, um, come early for networking, that's fantastic. And again, if you guys want to go network and you guys have some things to talk about, feel free to step outside, won't bug me at all. That's no big deal. And uh, stay after as well. Uh, right about uh, 9 p.m. we should be wrapping it up, depending on the questions that may be asked. And then we also meet back in the bar and for more networking. So it's a good opportunity to get your business cards out, get to know one, e one you know, each other, and find out maybe what's missing in your business and maybe connect with a person that can fill that gap in your business. Uh, we meet on the first Thursday of every month. Now that does exclude next month. It's going to be, uh, the meeting would, would be held on the 3rd of July. Now, a lot of people are going on vacation, so we decided to have Independence Day, and hopefully we can all be in independently uh, wealthy as well. So that's why uh, we're not having a meeting next month, but feel free to join us in August. This is the best place to learn and grow, and uh, definitely invite uh, friends and help them uh, to learn and grow as well. And. Tonight, you guys are going to be talking, or you're going to hear uh, from three experts on how to build a passive real estate portfolio. And passive meaning you guys don't have to work for the money, the, the money is working for you, or your projects are working for you. So, in the meantime, I'd like to uh, introduce and bring on stage a good friend of mine. He's been a, a mentor to me. He owns a couple of businesses, and uh, he's an amazing character, amazing guy. Amir Karkuti, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, hello. Amazing character. I don't know if I should take offense to that. Amazing character. I like it. How's everyone doing? Come on, you guys. You can do better than that. How's everyone doing? There you go. Make it sound like we're at a Tony Robbins event. We've got to do this right. So welcome to tonight's meeting. I have actually been gone for the last four or five meetings. I'm sure some of you guys have missed me, but I recently just got married. So I was, uh, I was gone, went to my honeymoon. Thank you, thank you. And uh, one thing, I, it was funny, as I was getting married, some of my friends were like ecstatic for me. And there's other, some of my other friends who are married are like, why are you doing it? You know, you hear that all the time. And I asked my friends like, what are some of the things that'll change once you're married? And they said, well, first of all, you won't be able to do what you want to do. And I'm like, that's never going to change for me. Because I told my friend, I'm, I'm going to do whatever I, ever, whatever I want to do. I just have to ask my wife's permission now. And it's, it's been kind of interesting. It's new to me. Um, tonight's meeting, as, as he was mentioning, it's kind of, I love panels because we can do questions and answers. It's the way that I learn the most. And I'm really excited that the three people that are going to be coming up tonight is going to be awesome. Or next week, if some of you guys don't know, but Phoebe, do you guys know what that stands for? For investors, buy investors. For investors, buy investors. Do you want to say something about this real quick? Uh, sure, actually. Does someone not working on that? I, let me bring the microphone over. One of our panelists tonight is a gentleman by the name of Jeremy Roll. He's actually the co-founder of the Phoebe uh, All Chapters. So I'm going to actually let him speak a little bit about what's coming up next week. Thank you. Ooh, sorry, Eric. Um, hi, my name is Jeremy Roll. I probably don't mo know most of you. I actually live up in LA. This is only the second time I've been to this uh, FIBI. But um, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, I actually started F4 Investors by Investors with one other person back in 2007. And the reason why we have FIBI is that we try to hold to a core foundation of not selling anything at our meetings. Um, I was actually went to real estate meetings for years, have been investing for years, and just was waiting sometimes through sales pitches to be able to network with people at the end and after getting a little fed up sitting in the back of the room for like three hours at some meetings um, I just decided to start a meeting myself so if you go to any other FIBI meetings and we have actually quite a few in LA and then one Orange County one San Diego um, you'll see that hopefully we don't have any selling if you ever do come across selling at ever any of our meetings please let us know we really take that very seriously so we have a um, semi-annual um, networking event that we t that takes place once in the summer in June and once in December um, we have it through all our chapters uh, and we 
currently have, I think, about 260 to 270 RCPs, but we should have about 350 RCPs by the time we have the event next week. It's next Thursday in Long Beach, which is uh, a bit of a trek from here, but we actually do in Long Beach to try and make it uh, somewhat close to here versus some people that are further north in LA. So uh, we hope to see as many of you that can come join us. It's actually just a big networking room. There's no presenter, there's no panel. It just meant for networking, open room for hours. Um, and uh, it's um, June 12th at uh, 630 to 11 up in Long Beach. If you have any questions, actually, you're welcome. Feel free to come see me at the end of this meeting. I'll be on the panel, but once the meeting's done, feel free to come see me if you have any questions. Thanks very much for coming, by the way, tonight. We really appreciate you guys coming out here. So. Who should I hand the mic back? Thank you. What's good about those events as well, it only takes one person you meet that can change your complete business. You don't have to meet hundreds of people. Um, when I was 26, year, 20, yeah, 26 years old, I, w I made $1.8 million. It, it was debt, but it was, you know, I made it. And I happened to go to a networking meeting. It was a meeting, on, it was a guy named Dan Kennedy had a marketing meeting. And I went, flew over to Texas, sat down next to a gentleman that happened to just move to San Diego. And he said, hey, we talked a little bit. I ended up coming here. And he said, let me, let me find out about your finances a little bit. Let's see what you're doing. At the time, I owned seven restaurants and I completely bankrupted. Within a year, he got me out of my debt made me profitable. His name is Reggie Lal, and some of you guys might know him. He's, uh, he actually used to run this Phoebe. And again, it just takes one person to change your world. So go to these events. Go, go, you know, don't try to go around and try to market yourself. Go and find out what people are doing. Go find out if the person you're talking to has something of value to you and if you have, more importantly, of value to them. 10th anniversary dinner party meeting with Bruce Norris. We have Eric, I believe, that wanted to say something. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, hi everybody, I'm Eric Sirgis. I'm president of the NSDREI and also the, one of the panelists uh, for tonight. And really quick, we're very excited about our 10th anniversary party. Um, 10 years is a long time. We're glad to still be around. And I know as these guys know running clubs, it's, uh, it says something. And we're just so thankful for all the people that have supported us throughout the years. And we want to have a big bash. And you guys are all invited. So we're having Bruce Norris. And how many people have never heard Bruce Norris speak? I'm just curious. OK, how many people have heard Bruce Norris speak? And then the rest of you have no opinion. Okay. Well, whether you, if, you've, if you've never heard him, you have to come because he's one of the, the pillars of this business. And if you have heard him before, this is, believe it or not, a completely special presentation he's putting together just for us. Looking back, looking forward, looking inside, looking back 10 years, looking forward 10 years, and then the big part of it, which is the why part of investing. And so it's a whole brand new presentation that he's going to be putting together for us. We're going to have an ice sculpture, which made Jay Sherman's dream come true, balloons, live music. Um, it's a dinner for those who want to attend the dinner portion, or you can just walk in. The dinner uh, seats are almost fully taken, um, so if you want to be one of the uh, people that can come have dinner and network during the dinner time, definitely go to the NSDREI.org and sign up. But we're really excited about it. It's going to be a great, fun event, but as always, good networking and amazing education from Bruce. So hope you guys can all join us. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. Oh, I want to I want to clarify something. It says choose of each moth. There are no moths there. It's going to be fine. It'll be a beautiful time, but it's not if Tuesday of each moth. Just want to clarify that. <clears throat> Meeting second Tuesday of each moth. We also have the San Diego Creative Investive San Diego Creative Investors Association, which is run by Bill Tan. Bill Tan, I've actually known since I was 16 years old. He's been one of my customers at my restaurants for that long. One of the best guys to, to learn from. He makes things so simple. How many of you guys are new to real estate investing, by the way? Okay, a lot of you. If you have the opportunity, go check him out. He, is, he makes things fun, easy, and understandable. So, can I just mention we're having Robert Campbell at the uh, State Investment Association? Perfect. So, Robert Campbell, who wrote a book called. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, the guy is amazing to listen to. The guy is a wealth of knowledge. He's been here a few times as well. Before we continue, I gotta make a disclosure. We are not tax advisors, attorneys, legal professionals, or financial advisors. We are simply real estate investors. Please review all these documents with your legal and or professional advisors. The stuff you hear here, use it to your discretion, follow up with your attorneys and other you know, people that are in the industry, make sure that you're investing in something that makes sense. 
All the figures and all the charts or forms are estimates and they're examples only. There's no returns or guarantees. Your network is your team. Take a look up here, you'll notice all these people from title reps to past speakers, escrow companies, home inspectors, they're in this room. Take the opportunity, like I was mentioning, to go and talk to people and find out what they're doing and see if they match and fit in your team. Now what to expect tonight? You're gonna to meet some of the sponsors that make this possible. You're gonna see some market updates of what's actually happening in real time in real estate. Uh, a deal profile of how someone can make money in real estate. Panel of speakers are gonna be up here. We're gonna do a wrap up and then we're gonna do one of my favorite things, drink. All right, now, <laughs> networking in the bar. And none of this really would, not, would have happened if it wasn't for our sponsors. So I want you to take a look up here, remember some of the people, well, this one person, remember her, but remember the names and go say hi to them, give them a big thank you, and uh, let's we'll give them a big thank you right now. Just say thank you. We're actually gonna bring our sponsors on stage. And because they help us out and because we couldn't do this without them, we couldn't do this without you, uh, we're gonna give them just a little bit of time to tell a little bit about themselves and what they do and hopefully they can offer you something as well. So let's bring our sponsors up. You're closest, Joe. Why don't you come on up? Good evening, everyone. My name is Joe Mendoza. I'm a real estate broker with Equity California Real Estate. How many of you have a real estate license? How many of you would like to get a real estate license? How many of you would like to do your first deal? Okay, one, two. I'm talking to these two, probably. <laughs> You might want to consider getting a real estate license. Uh, if you want to do your first deal, real estate license does help, especially if you don't know what you're talking about, some of the forms, etc. cetera. Uh, equity real estate, what makes us truly unique is we're not like the bigger names out there, these bigger franchises that are taking a huge cut. We're only taking $4.99 per transaction, $499 per transaction. So every closing, all you get is the majority and give the house 499 keep the rest uh, once again joe mendoza 619-246-HOME h-o-m-e thank you thank you joe thank you and next we have uh, david how you doing david amir so amir said earlier you might meet somebody one person who's going to change your business and change your career I don't know if that's me, but I'm, <laughs> I'm David Weiner with Trillion Capital. Uh, we are a hard money lender specializing in fix and flip finance. Um, you'll hear from lots of other lenders, don't believe anything they say, but, but we, we'll, we'll, fo we'll follow up and do what we say. So um, fix and flip financing, Trillion Capital. Oh, phone number. Oh. Phone number is 858-530-2251. Uh, Thank you, David. Daniel Brock. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is uh, Brock Vandenberg. I'm with uh, Talamar Financial. We are a hard money lender here in San Diego. We specialize in financing fix and flip, residential income property, commercial deals. Uh, if you need capital quickly, we can finance your uh, residential commercial real estate transaction. Um, I was up here last week, or I'm sorry, what, last month. Excuse me. And um, I had an uh, investor, first time investor, contact me. He had uh, locked up a transaction here in San Diego. He didn't know to, uh, who to go to. We were able to fund his transaction in five business days, uh, help him with his equity partner, um, create a solution that made sense for all of us, and we funded that transaction. Um, it was a great experience for him. It was a great experience for us. That's what we can do for you. We are uh, Talamar Financial. Uh, you can reach me at 858-613-0111, extension 1, 858-613-0111, extension 1. Thank you. Thank you, Rock. By the way, the lenders that are up here, they all provide a little bit something different. So if you are looking for funding, call them all and find out what's going to work best for you. Hi everybody, I'm Gabby Benavides with U Direct IRA Services, and we're a self-directed uh, self company. Um, we have helped thousands of Americans invest out of the Aztec 
outside of the stock market into alternative assets such as real estate and notes and tax liens. If you guys would like to learn more information, I can be reached at 949-445-9633. Thank you very much. What's the name of the business? You direct IRA services. You direct IRA services. Okay, next we got Brian. Hey, Brian. Or you can just call me at AccuPlan. <laughs> <laughs> I tease, I love Gabby. Uh, I'm Brian Davis with AccuPlan, a self-directed IRA specialist. I help people invest in real estate with their IRAs and 401ks. I saw a lot of realtors in here. How many of you guys are self-employed in here? How many of you guys have a solo 401k? All right, about a third of you. Well, if you want a solo 401k, I offer one with no annual fees, and you ha it has checkbook writing authority with it. I also have a checkbook IRA, a business trust, where you don't have to pay the California Franchise Tax Board $800 a year. If you want to learn more about investing with your IRAs or a solo 401k, I have some flyers in the back, or you can call me at 619-892-2438. Again, it's Brian Davis with AccuPlan. Good e Hi. Good evening, everyone. I'm Diane Oliver. I'm a real estate investor, have been forever, love real estate investing, and I am a realtor for investors. That's all I do. No normal people, no houses in the country, no perfect kitchens, just investors. So we'll do the hands up one more time. How many are not real estate agents? Raise your hands. There we go. How many of you need help finding properties? There you go. That's what I have my cards for. I'd be happy to give you one. Um, be happy to help you out. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. All right, Belinda, you're up. That's okay. Thank you. Hi, Belinda Savage. I'm with IRA Services Trust. We've been around 35 years. If you want to open up a self-directed, we do 48-hour funding for a private note, and it only costs $136 for the year. Come talk to me. I'm an educational source, and I also talk to you about real estate strategy. So I'd love to share my ideas and my knowledge and my expertise. I've been a former compliance director and a real estate strategist. Take care. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Belinda. All right. Awesome. Give them one, another big round of applause. Awesome. Mark this, mark up this right now. Before. I guess market updates may as well get it done. All right, let's do it. Market updates with me, the one and only. Awesome! Give him a round of applause. Thank you, Amir, very much. All right. Well, we got some uh, interesting news and not so interesting news. Um, so, market updates. We try to. Uh, help us understand the market, and that includes price direction, momentum, uh, interest rates, uh, sales inventories and numbers, those kinds of things, and then employment figures as well. And these all affect the market. I mean, how many of you have noticed a, a pretty dramatic change in the last two to three months in the market? Right. Okay, and that's because, well, we're going to find out a little bit here. Uh, home sales have gained 20% for the month, but year to date, they've been the lowest since 2008. And uh, if I can read this, California single family homes and condominium sales in April of 2014, they were up 20% for the month, but were down 13.3% from April of last year. Uh, despite the gains, year to date sales volume was at its lowest level since 2008. And for the month, uh, both distressed and non distressed property sales posted gains. So it's been a little slower. Um, even though interest rates are down, uh, the equity in people's homes have also come up, which means people aren't, not as many distressed homeowners are out there. Therefore, there's not as many properties for us investors to purchase as well. Uh, I'll probably show you a slide here that has to do with trustee sales and LLCs purchasing properties with cash. So, with that said, the, uh, uh, there you go, sales are down compared to year over year. So that's all property sales at 20%. Now, distressed property sales, uh, for month over month, they're down 13.1%. And that tells us the market's slowing down a little bit. There's not as many properties out there for us to buy. Uh, the year over year home sales, again, we just went over this, all properties were down about 4.7%. Um, but distressed properties were down almost 50%. We're at 43% uh, decline. So, medium sales price versus the sales volume. Uh, medium sales prices, they've gone up, which means the equity in people's homes have 
uh, gone up as well. And there's, again, not as many people that are hurting at this point. So they find creative ways to, to figure out how to keep their home. So if you're in that kind of a market, that's a pretty good market for you to be in. Oftentimes, we'll actually partner with homeowners as well to help them out. And at the end, we'll split equity with the homeowners. But it allows them to keep their home, save them from foreclosure, and they still get to be uh, equitable at the end of it as well. So the, uh, and there we go, there's the equity. So what are we looking at? 100 and, uh, or three and a half percent, 13 and a half percent of California homeowners, nearly 1.2 million are still underwater. But that's a dramatic change from, from last year. The uh, cash sales, as you can see, this, this little line right there, we're down. We're down, I mean, where are we, 24%? Um, and that's similar back to you know, July and back in 09 and 010. So uh, cash sales are definitely uh, as a decline as well. And a lot of people, when they say cash sales, it could mean you know, borrowing money from the hard money lenders. Those are considered cash sales as well. It doesn't have to be your cash but they're typically not loans, FHA, VA loans, okay? Flipping, now this just means a property that's been bought and then resold within six months. Uh, a pretty drast uh, drastic decline over the last couple of months, but it's starting to pick back up. In California, we do notice this. Uh, California cycles, uh, you'll know that towards November, December, January, February, a lot of the sales are always down. So nothing to be uh, too alarmed about. But the fact is, you know, flipping is down. There's not as many people. There's a lot of people actually going out of business right now, you know, the smaller investors and stuff. So you gotta be really smart and make sure that you got the right team in place. Uh, markets purchased by LLCs and LPs, which are companies. Um, our company is an LLC, so we would fall under this category. Again, they're down. Trustee sales, purchases by LLCs and LPs. People standing on the, uh, the courthouse steps buying property. Um, they've been up, you know, since uh, late October of uh, 13. They went up a little bit, but uh, we've noticed actually they came down January, February, March as well. So there's just not a lot of stuff that the, the banks are not letting go of the properties. That a lot of the REOs they were holding on to till the market because they could, they actually can, they can actually affect the market. If these, if the banks take a whole bunch of property back. There's nothing on the, on the market. If they were to let all those properties go at one time, there would be a lot less competition, therefore pr uh, prices would drop. So instead the banks let these things go li little bits at a time in order to maintain the market and hopefully bring that market up, which we've seen. And foreclosure investors, people that are buying foreclosures. Um, it's pretty steady, uh, a pretty steady decline, but those are pretty decent numbers actually. Um, the ones that have been scheduled for sale though, you know, 44 and a half percent, we're down 44 and a half percent year over year. And again, the banks, they're, they're not letting these properties go like they used to be. So right now, compared to last month, we're pretty close to the same. We're about 4.2 percent on uh, FHA financing or VA financing. Um, so interest rates are still low. There are still buyers out there. People still do qualify. And because people now are getting jobs back, I think we're down to about 7% here in San Diego County, um, people are employed, which means they can afford more. That means housing prices come up. The more the house prices go up, though, the less people can afford. So it's kind of, if you can picture this whole uh, bubble that we're, I'm not going to say bubble, but if you can picture the whole thing that we're in, uh, interestingly enough, like, when people have a job, they can afford a home. When the home prices go up, they can't afford that home anymore. And I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of condos and townhomes have been on the rise as well because that's where the entry level is right now. If you've noticed that back in 2006 and 7, it was the same kind of situation where a lot of condos and townhomes, they skyrocketed. And then when it crashed, they're the ones that got hit the hardest. So a lot of investors have come in, they buy these things for twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, they double, triple in value, and then they liquidate. So play it safe, be smart, build a good team, ask a lot of questions, and uh, go do some deals. So educate, network, and take action. That's all it's about. Next, we're actually going to uh, talk to a couple of gentlemen who uh, have done a deal. In fact, recently, they just closed uh, on, a, on a property two weeks ago, I believe. Uh, J&B House Solutions. We're going to bring up Brian. Come on up here. Let's give him a hand.
How's everybody doing tonight? Good, good. All right, so uh, we're JMB House Solutions. Some of you may know us. Um, we, we've been seen in these rooms quite a bit, but uh, Jason and I actually formed a business uh, back last September um, after really kind of getting to know each other in these rooms, dealing with each other in, in, various, um, in various ways. We, we, we realized pretty quickly that we had a lot of the same common goals, same beliefs, um, and whatnot, so we put together a, a company and we went out and we started doing deals, and we've, you know, I'd say we've had pretty good success in the short period of time that we've been together, um, and, and this is one of the uh, one of the first deals that we actually um, we, we actually did. I think this was deal number two or three, but it was right there in the beginning. So um, this is a property we call uh, we'll call Dafter Drive. Um, so this property was located in Oak Park. For those of you that don't know where that is, it's off of Euclid in the 94. Um, it's basically San Diego. Uh, we found it on the MLS. Funny story, actually, I was sitting in a hotel lobby having breakfast on my day job, getting ready to go start. I was out of town. And I was sitting there having breakfast, scrolling through the MLS, and this one kind of popped up and caught my eye. So I sent it over to Jay after I'd ran a few quick numbers, and I said, hey, I'm, you, know, you might want to take a look at this. Um, there might be some good stuff here. So I went off, and, and he did the rest. So. Um, originally what had happened, he called the agent direct. This property had fallen out of escrow. Um, so we got the call after it fell out of escrow. We'd put the bug in the air in her ear that we were you know, interested in it. It looked originally like a cosmetic rehab. Um, Jason went and looked at it, walked through it. He called me a little bit later that day and he goes, he goes, Brian, he goes, I think this is this is a deal, man. He goes, this, you know, it's pretty cosmetic. There's not a lot that's gotta be done to it. Is your typical uh, four bedroom, two bath. 1,500 square foot home, so I thought, you know, perfect, quick in and out flip. And then we noticed there was some issues. Yep. There were some issues in the back with the retaining wall, kind of, kind of sloped down a hill. So then we started to get more into it and found some more issues to negotiate with. Yep. So it was a trust sale. Um, an older gentleman, he passed away in, in the property. Um, and it was priced right, right? So it was priced right around 305. Um, our first offer went in at 282. Um, we thought ARV was somewhere around 385. We felt pretty strong about that ARV. Now, for those of you that don't know this area, this pocket is, if you looked at, the, at a half mile radius, you'd say, well, that's a really, really bad area, and you'd probably have a hard time finding the 385 comps. But there's pockets within this, this radius that really the comps were well supported, so you had to dig kind of deep. Um, but they, it was there. So they were asking 305. Um, we used a standard RPA, uh, a JV agreement, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, you know, note and deed. A um, couple things that we uncovered when we started our inspections. Um, we found out that there was really a, a, a pretty serious drainage issue going on in the backyard. Um, the patio, the back patio had some major cracks in it. Um, there was some issues going on with the retaining wall because it did sit on a hill. And, and so it was really all the results of some drainage. So we hired a soil engineer, brought him in. He told us kind of some ideas that he had. Um, so anyway, bottom line is um, we had some, some bigger issues we had to deal with there. So we ended up with asking for a $50,000 discount. Um, seller went off, got their own estimates, came back to us and said, yep, we agree. So here's your $50,000 discount. Final purchase price was 232000 but our rehab budget went way up too. <laughs> we thought it was going to be a, a 30 grand rehab and we ended up you know, doubling that. So. so we started putting our money together um, at the very last minute. Um, we had some gap funders that were, were working with us on this at the very last minute, backed out. Didn't see the 385 ARV. So we kind of scrambled a little bit and we came to, to Kukin and Clark here, Daryl and Emron, we called them. And we said, look, you guys interested in possibly JVing on this deal? So they came out, they looked at it, said, yep, numbers look good, property looks good. So we put together a joint venture agreement with these guys, and away we went. Uh, we did a hard money loan for $200,000 with our, our friend David from Trillion Capital. He's out here somewhere in the... Um, and then we, uh, Cook and Clark funded, found, uh, funded all the gap. They funded all of the rehab. And uh, 
J and B contributed a whopping $6,200 to the deal. Good return on investment. Total 304,000. So here's some uh, some before pictures. You can see the uh, the patio dark, really covered up. There was no yard, so to speak. Um, you know, bathroom. Rehab ended up at about 65,000. We originally budgeted 60,000 is what we we budgeted. It ended up going out to about 65. Um, you can see kind of some before and after pictures there of the front of the house. And then the kitchen. Uh, those are actually the original cabinets, believe it or not. We chose to refinish the original cabinets as opposed to replace them. They were really nice, uh, high quality cabinets. They were just a little old and needed refinished. Um, some more after pictures there. Uh, so basically the financial summary on this was purchase of 232, rehab costs with everything, staging and everything came out to about 72.6. Uh, closing costs were right around 35,000 front and back end. Total investment was 339.6. Um, we ended up selling it for 417,000. Um, the, uh, the, the buyers had asked for a 10K credit back on that as well. So um, it was for closing costs, but sales price was 417. We had about 16.6 in money costs for a almost $61,000 profit on the deal. So, well, although um, the appraisal did come back <clears throat> way under the our offer price came in at, so we had to dispute the value a little bit there, and Imran negotiated it, and we got a new appraisal come in, and it, we got the full yeah. amount that our offer came in at. So, yeah. So it worked out pretty good. So really, the the action, the follow up on this is you know take action, make phone calls. Um, you know when you see something that looks like a good deal, chase it, go get it. You know make it work. Um, don't give up on the deal. You know, even if somebody backs out on you in the last minute, there's a lot of people in this room that you can you can count on. These guys came to the rescue for us. Um, it's not our first joint JV deal with these guys. We've got we've got another big one going on right now. Um, but they've been been instrumental in, in Jason and I's uh, success and growth. Um, so build your network, have have your money sources lined up, um, grow, educate. Obviously, you're here. Um, think outside the box, and, and if you just keep doing those things, success is inevitable. It's it's just going to happen. All right. Thank you, guys. Fantastic. Yes. So you mentioned the, the uh, appraised value was disputed. So the appraised, appraisal came in under the offer. The appraisal price. did come in under the offer price. How did you deal with that? We disputed the appraisal, and what we ended up doing was they actually ended up switching lenders and getting a new appraisal from a new lender, and it worked out great. So it still had to come from the lender. Yes. 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 Do you recommend getting an appraisal before you put it? In? After you rehab it, but before you put it on the market, you recommend having getting an appraisal. There's no reason to. There's no reason to get an appraisal after we finish the rehab because that appraisal is not going to count towards the other buyers' lenders anyway. So you can tell the buyer, look, we have an appraisal. No, you can. In the contracts, though, what you can do is you can say uh, your offer is accepted, uh, contingent on the appraisal, or not contingent on the appraisal. So it wouldn't matter what the appraisal came in at, they could still purchase the, purchase the house. Even if the appraisal came in low, they would just have to make up the difference. I was referring to convincing them to pay higher. You have the appraisal in your hand to convince the buyer. To well, we don't need to convince anybody to buy a property. We're, they're going to pay what they want to pay for it. So uh, if you guys would like to share a deal with us, just like Brian and Jason, feel free to contact us. Email us at San Diego Investment Club at Gmail. And we'd love to have you guys on stage as well. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to get started. We're going to bring our panel up. And so again, how to build a passive real estate portfolio. Uh, unfortunately, Jillian couldn't make it tonight. But we have Rashish, is that right? And uh, Jeremy Roll and Eric Saragusa. Give them a really warm welcome. You guys are going to learn a ton tonight. Thank you. Well, welcome, guys. Thank you so much for taking your time. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Rashish. Thank you. And thank you, Jeremy, very much. So as we move along, um, introductions, actually. What we're going to do is we're going to take a couple minutes in length, and we're just going to ask you uh, what you guys each specialize in. And if you want, you can just pass the mic back and forth. That'd be great, unless you guys want the wireless ones. Um, and then the second question is, what is your experience in dealing with real estate investments? So 
Uh, Jeremy, what do you specialize in? Um, I am a uh, full-time passive uh, cash flow investor. Uh, most of what I invest in is real estate, and I just happen to like commercial real estate because of the tenant diversification. And um, I back in uh, 2002, I started to look into cash flow because I was sick and tired of the unpredictability of the stock market and you know after the dot-com crash. So I'm a very low, low risk, low steady guy. So um, I kind of came across real estate cash flow in general and I rotated all my money out of stocks and bonds into cash flow. And um, I just love, to me, the thing about cash flow is the predictability. You know, I, I invest in low risk things that tend to have predictable cash flow and cash flow going in. Um, I actually got out of the corporate world in 07 uh, off of living off the cash flow and um, now I'm, so I, when I built up enough cash flow to live off, I should say. And so now I've been a full-time passive cash flow investor for about seven years and I just don't want to go back to the corporate world. That's what, that's what I'm about. Fantastic, that's great. Rashish, you're next. Uh, what do you specialize in? Um, well, I think most of you noticed I'm not a Caucasian female at this point. My name is Rishi Thakar, and I work at Realty Mogul. Realty Mogul is an online, online crowdfunding platform for real estate. Um, historically, I've always worked at large institutional real estate shops, working on big buildings, massive developments, and uh, one of the reasons that Realty Mogul attracted me is because everyday average investors like ourselves don't have access to some of those mega developments that seem so sexy and seem so um, interesting to invest in. And quite frankly, I think when I saw some of the larger institutions of the world uh, going out to raise money from accredited investors like ourselves, <clears throat> the cost to access those deals was just so drastic that there needed to be a disintermediation of the industry um, as a whole. And I just thought that not the old traditional flow of capital was broken, but there's just better ways to go about it through technology and, and, and the way the laws have evolved. So that's, that's my background. Eric. Yeah, the great thing about this panel is you get to see different aspects of the passive real estate investing. And what I do, my partners and I, uh, with MHP funds, uh, my partners Dave Reynolds and Frank Roth, we manage, co-manage uh, private investment funds with mobile home parks. So like Jeremy, I'm a big believer in, in passive income and a big believer in cash flow. And when I was kind of looking at what I wanted to do, I kind of had kind of three things that I really wanted to look for in whichever asset class that I was going to be focusing on and it was cash flow it was creating value and then through all of that low risk and when I really dug into mobile home parks and what they had to offer that was just struck a chord with me as the the asset class that I wanted to stick with so and then on top of that I'm, as I mentioned earlier president of the North San Diego Real Estate Investors Association and um, thank you for having us here tonight on the on this panel you're welcome um, well I'll let you keep the microphone there and what is your experience in dealing with the real estate investments yeah, so as, as I mentioned, really what I, when I kind of finally decided what it was I wanted, and it's a whole difference between speculation and investing, and to me when I looked at what was going on in different markets, and I looked at investors that I thought were extremely successful, and those that weathered the storms, it was all about this cash flow. And really, if you had cash flow as the foundation of your investment, um, it just really it lowered that risk and allowed you to weather storms. And so it really was with mobile home parks. For me, that's what I decided was the case. So we've been doing these funds for quite a few quite a few years now, and basically, with mobile home parks, it's there's a lot. You know, there's a, for a lot of people, if I asked you, you know, what's your first impression of a mobile home park, um, you probably twinge, maybe get a little uncomfortable in your chair, um, turn your head. You know, it's not something that kind of joke with friends. It's, it's not a sexy investment. They're not, they're not trophy properties. And so, you know, but what they are is they're, they're cash cows and there's just lots of ways you can get in and you can create value and they're, they serve a very important need with affordable housing. So. That's really what you know. My focus is now and has been for quite a few years. Okay, Rashish, uh, what is your experience in actual real estate investments? Um, again, historically, I've always worked uh, at larger institutions, so buying and selling of massive buildings and working on massive developments um, in New York, San Francisco, Miami. You know, you name it. Um, you know, some 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 major buildings that some of you all may have seen. Uh, I was somewhat involved in some of those transactions. Um, I can name a couple if if it makes sense. But uh, you know, that's that's pretty much what I've always done. Okay. Um, so I've been investing in uh, real estate since 2002. So it's been about 12 years, um, and uh, I'm probably I, I honestly don't have exact numbers, but I'm probably in about. 
uh, currently actually, because some stuff sold off over time, probably in about 50, 45 to 50 LLCs right now. Um, and um, probably half or more than half are probably real estate, I guess. Um, I've actually invested in, you know, I take, some, I'm a small, I invest passively. So I invest in managed opportunities, kind of like what Eric puts together. And I always make a bet on an operator. So that's why I call myself passive. And I've probably invested, you know, I'm usually a small piece of a big deal. So I'm a very small piece of this, but I probably invested in about 350 million worth of assets, you know, give or take. Um, that includes commercial and residential and some notes and some hard money and some other stuff too. So now you mentioned operator. For those of the, uh, for those everybody in the audience that don't know what an operator is, can you explain a little bit about what that is? Yeah. So Eric's actually what I call an operator. It's it's this, it's kind of there's those synonymous words like operator, manager, syndicator. It's um, managers of an LLC who actually will pull uh, investors together and will then uh, operate. Uh, or manage an actual piece of real estate or some type of opportunity. So I just call them operator. Okay. So I, I think Imran and I would be considered operators as well. Okay. As a as a running the business and running the fix and flip part of it and you know doing those kinds of things. That's an operator. Okay. Um, so let me ask this question: What's the difference between active and passive investments? Yeah, so uh, I guess I'll have the mic, so I'll answer first. But to, I think every, everybody has their own definition of active versus passive. Um, and um, to me, passive, I, I consider myself passive in that I trade control for diversification. So the big benefit to the way that I invest is that I can be diversified across geographies, operators, asset classes, so many different things. And actually, one of the big advantages is once the market changes, I can actually change asset classes. So Eric, for example, invests in mobile home parks. That's what he does. And he's always going to be investing in mobile home parks. Um, and I can choose to invest in mobile home parks now and then do hard money last year and do uh, pretty much anything at any time, depending on I feel about the cycle. Um, uh, by the way, I love mobile home parks, so I'm not putting mobile. <laughs> I've actually invested in three of Eric's funds, so I actually love what he's doing. I'm not trying to put Eric down. I'm just saying there's a difference. Um, and so, f for me, active is someone who um, has control over what they're investing in. Um, so when I invest it passively, I'm a very small piece of a big deal. I'm a minority vote. My vote is pretty much meaningless because I'm such a small percentage of the deal. And so I am putting full faith in someone like Eric to actually run something well and make day-to-day -day decisions. Someone who's active can decide when to buy and sell a property, you know, if they want to hire a uh, different uh, property manager, if they want to decide they're going to evict the tenant, they have typically more active control over the uh, the investment. And um, so I give up that control in exchange for, in my opinion, in exchange for diversification, active versus passive. Okay. Would you guys agree? Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, basically, active investing is just that. You're, uh, something goes out at the property and you're actively going out to fix the problem. Uh, a passive investor has the luxury and benefit of trusting a sponsor, but you're giving up the control over you know, what color he paints the building. Um, so I think that's just a basic difference of it. And taking one step back to, um, yeah, I know you had the disclaimer up there before, but I always like to reiterate the disclaimer for anybody who's come to these meetings and heard, you know, Kim Taylor and others talk about it. You know, this the whole goal is education tonight, not solicitation or anything else. We're up here to just educate you guys on what we know and what we're doing, not trying to get you to do anything else. So just want to make sure that's very clear. Um, you know, I, it's funny. I totally agree with what they both said about you know the definition of active versus passive. But to me, that passive is a bit of a misnomer because you're never you never should be completely passive. You're just active in a different way. And I can tell you right now, this full-time passive investor is the least passive person I've ever met in my life. Okay. Um, and he'll probably tell you, I think he schedules his time down to the minute every day and is as actively involved in his passive investments as, as you should be. And it's a credit to him because he is one of the most detailed guys I know and because he cares about what he's investing in. And if you're going to be a passive investor, you're not doing the work, you're not painting like Rishi was saying, you're not making some of those decisions, but you are actively looking over and managing your money and your investment. So you don't don't have it in your mindset that you're just handing it off and ignoring it because you should be keeping on top of what's going on and making sure that that operator is doing what they said they're going to do and just staying on top and, and doing that. So Due diligence. And let me just add to that that one of the reasons why I'm so busy is because if you're going to go down the passive route, you basically have two choices. You can either try and find opportunities yourself, which is what I've done. And I've been really lucky because being the co-founder of FIBI, I just happened to 
have a really big network. Um, and so that's actually how I found a lot of the opportunities that I invest in. Um, and so I spend a lot of my time not just reviewing the opportunities, but tr frankly networking to try and find them. Um, and I network with other investors to trade opportunities. I network with other operators like Eric. I'm just networking all the time. And so that's actually the hardest part of being a passive investor, especially when you consider the fact that cash flow doesn't go on forever. There isn't one opportunity I could think of where cash flow is going to go on forever. Um, so that's the, you know, once you get into this long, long enough time, just have the correct expectation, even if you're going to be passive, that you're going to always try to, you're always going to have to try to find opportunities. The other way to do it without trying to find the opportunities directly is to go onto a site like Realty Mogul or some of the other uh, online crowdfunding sites that actually offer up the opportunities. Um, and there's a bit of a difference between investing in, with Realty Mogul and investing the way that I do in that I invest directly with an operator like Eric. With Realty Mogul, you're investing in a entity they're putting together and then they're investing that into the opportunity and they're actually doing the job of finding the opportunities for you though um, and just by the way as a disclaimer I didn't mention at the beginning so I actually um, I met the co-founder of Realty Mogul at one of our FIBI meetings before they launched and she actually took me on as an advisor before they started so I'm actually an uh, outside advisor for Realty Mogul um, so I happen to know a lot about them as well um, I've been an advisor for over 18 months so fantastic uh, so what are the advantages and or disadvantages of being a passive investor? Um, I'll start because I have the mic. Um, <laughs> do you want me to get mic'd up, by the way? Is that going to help? Do you guys want to get one mic up? Doesn't matter? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I would say um, advantage, the advantages for me, the big, big time advantages of being passive investors, I don't normally hear all of whatever happens, even in closing a deal. I mean, I've actually been exposed to the closing process a couple of times in closing a larger commercial deal, and it boggles my mind, thank you. It, uh, it boggles my mind how much detail and how many things can happen and how many ups and downs there are. And let alone once the, uh, once the deal, um, thank you, once the deal closes, the toilets and whatever else happens, I actually have no clue how to run a property, even though I'm invested in many properties. And my expertise is in actually filtering out opportunities and, and trying to get a gut feel of who I'm making a bet on running background checks on them. That's my job. My job is all up front. Eric's job is all ongoing, where he's actually managing the properties, adding value to the properties, and one of the big advantages is that I don't have to worry about any of that. And I think it would probably honestly drive me nuts. Um, one of the disadvantages is, um, as we discussed before, that um, I basically don't have um, control in the way that I invest. So that's what I'm giving up. Okay. Um, you want more? Uh, is this one? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything Jeremy just said. Um, you know, quite frankly, if you are, you know, let's look at an operator, for example. He is heavily invested in mobile parks. He lives, breathes, eats, sleeps mo mobile park homes on a daily basis. Uh, as a passive investor, you can diversify your strategy. As, as Jeremy alluded to earlier, you can invest in a mobile home park fund. You can invest in um, a multifamily fund. You can invest in a fix and flip fund. You can invest in various different strategies. And um, again, you can go in and out of those investments as a passive investor when your capital is re returned to you. So uh, I think some of the benefits of, again, being an operator is you have day-to-day -day control in the building and whatever property you're managing, <clears throat> you're managing it in accordance with what you want to do uh, versus a passive investor. You've, you, you've taken a bet on an operator. He's given you a business plan, which you're buying into, but you don't have the ability to go in on a daily basis and say you should do this differently or that differently. You can make suggestions, as Eric alluded to earlier, and that's what a good passive investor will be doing on an ongoing basis, but you're not technically out there on site making those changes. Yeah, that, is, this, is this on? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Um, yeah, and I, I agree with both of that. And then the other thing I kind of, I look at it though, is the pros and cons are often, um, it's down a little bit. They're often relative. It really depends on your particular situation. A pro for you might be a con for somebody else. And it, you know, I think we'll get to this maybe in some other, other questions, but you know, I think the, the biggest thing that when I talk with you know, potential investors and people trying to figure out what they want to do is they often don't know what they want to do. And that's the first step in deciding the whole route, the, the pro of passive versus active is, well, what is it that you're looking to do? What is the lifestyle that you're looking for? What are the goals? Are you looking for cash flow? Are you looking for equity? What is your five-year, 10-year plan? Really figuring out what it is that you ultimately want to do. And then it's a matter of, does passive fit into that plan or not? Does active fit into that plan? If you're somebody who wants to get in there and you want to have that control, you want to make those decisions, you want to go fly out to the properties, then passive is a con for you because it's not going to fulfill what you want to be doing. So it's not 
always so set in stone that the various pros and cons it often depends on you knowing what it is you exactly want to do so and then I agree with everything they said to, <laughs> on top of that yes yeah, so let me just add that you know this is we're happy to be interactive so if you guys have any questions at any time you can interrupt us please you, you want to take some questions <laughs> yes go ahead Sure. Do you want to repeat the question? Yeah, or, the yeah. question? Uh, yeah, the question was um, how do you bring sponsor, how do sponsors fit into a crowdfunding platform like ours? And I think that's a great question. Um, but before I get there, I guess, show of hands, who knows what crowdfunding is in the room? So, a fair number of you. Who does not know what crowdfunding is? Okay. So I'll, I'll get to your question, sir, but I think it's fair to just set the stage for some of the other folks here. Um, crowdfunding is basically it's modern day syndications um, through online portals, which the laws have evolved such that we can now do this. So prior to two years ago, there was what's called the Jobs Act, which I don't want to bore you with the legalities, but up until then, you could not actually solicit money for an investment online. Um, and, and, and even in April 2012, when the laws were passed, they didn't just pass overnight saying, okay, now anyone can post a website and raise money for whatever they want to do. That's all governed by Congress and the SEC. So we have to adhere to the laws. But basically, we can now, if we adhere to the laws, go out and raise capital for an, uh, an experienced sponsor or operator for one of their projects. Um, does that make sense to everyone here? Okay, so now going on to the gentleman's question, how does a sponsor post an asset on our platform? So... I think you missed something. I mean, it makes okay. sense, but I, for people that have heard that, that uh, crowdfunding really allows crowd, multiple investments to come together. Correct. Correct. So it's a modern day syndication. You know, historically when you've gone out to raise money for a project, you've gone to your, your, your mother, your brother, your father, you know, your close network of people. Now you can go out to a roster of accredited investors uh, and they can decide to invest in you through various channels, whether on the debt side or the equity yeah, side. Can I, let me just add something. Sure. So I, I, think, I think I understand what you're getting at. So actually what Realty Mogul and most of the other real estate platforms do is actually not truly crowdfunding. It's yeah. actually a really nice word they like to use because it's a cool term that's in right now and feel free to correct me if sure. I'm wrong but <laughs> crowdfunding the true essence of crowdfunding you're talking about is like you can invest $100 or $500 into a deal and they can take hundreds and hundreds and thousands of investors and it's actually really designed for startups um, what Realty Mogul is able to do is do syndication, which is when they're pulling real estate investors together, up to 99 investors most of the time, and they're able to do it um, as a joint venture equity partner, which means that they're not able to crowdfund hundreds and, or thousands of investors like you're thinking. There are rules that allow startups to be crowdfunded into thousands of investors. There are actually rules that are evolving that will allow for this eventually. Um, but, to, but, but just to be clear, and I don't want to confuse the room, but if you're getting down to like the legalities, Realty Mogul doesn't currently do true crowdfunding in the sense that you're thinking of it. It's more of a just, it's joining investors who are looking to be in passive opportunities. They find the opportunities, they get them uh, posted up, and the investors can join in in the exact same um, structure that I actually invested in the private opportunities, but more of a public way where you can find them online. So I think that's probably what you're getting at, right? Okay, sorry. No, no problem. I think that's an important clarification, yeah. Um, you know, again, as Jeremy alluded to, there are laws evolving such that we can go out and do true crowdfunding, but at the moment it just doesn't make sense to do so because the limits just aren't there for, for, um, for real estate projects. But going back to the gentleman's question about how a sponsor gets on our platform, um, you know, somebody like yourself may have a project that they want to raise equity for, and, and we, we raise debt as well, um, so we play in both the equity and debt space, but I think you're saying a sponsor is going out and trying to raise equity for a deal. So he's got a deal tied, he or she has a deal tied up, and <clears throat> you come to us, and if the deal makes sense, and you know, transparency is a big thing. We're, we're dealing with accredited investors that once you have various structures and various, you know, pools of capital and pref hurdles, 
which it's all very complicated, but it doesn't really sit well with the average retail investor. They want to know if I'm investing X amount of dollars, how do I get that X amount of dollars back and some return thereon? So we will vet that deal. We will vet the sponsor to make sure that you're somebody that the crowd should be investing in. Um, and uh, you know, assuming you, you, you pass those necessary steps, we'll work with you to put your asset up on the platform and we'll open it up for investment. Good question. Yes. Uh, so does the investor participate in the upside return of that investment as well? Or is it just an ROI on the money as if you were, if you were a private funder? So on the equity side, if we raise equity capital, yeah, it would be subject to a joint venture LLC agreement and, you know, the return dynamics would be outlined therein. Um, so, but yes, they would participate in the upside from any appreciation. Again, subject to that operating agreement. Subsequently on the debt side, if a sponsor has the equity and they simply need the debt for a project, then that's going to be an interest rate um, and it's going to be structured much like a, a, an ordinary loan. Basically every, every project's different. So if it's a project that's looking for that, then that could be up there, or if it's a project that's just looking for debt, you might see that up there. Correct. Is there another question? Someone yes, sir. Um, at present, again, going back to, you know, I don't want to bore anyone with the laws, but the Jobs Act has three main act, three main titles that impact crowdfunding and private placements. There's Title II, there's Title III, and Title IV. So Title II is really the area where folks are playing, and that opens it up for private placements. Um, and private placements are for accredited investors only. And the definition of an accredited investor is someone with a million dollars of net worth, or someone that's made $200,000 for two consecutive years, or 300,000 if you are married. Um, so that's the real area that we can play in currently. For Title III and Title IV, we're watching them closely, but the limits on going out to the general public and raising crowd money um, and all the restrictions, because basically you're forming a public company, so you have to go to the SEC, provide a number of disclosures, provide all your you know paperwork and documentation for taking a company public so you can go out to unaccredited investors. You know, at, at, at present, the limits are a million in Title III and five million in Title IV. Um, so it's just cost prohibitive to form a public company if you can only raise a million or five million dollars. Uh, a question for Jeremy. Jeremy, you mentioned that you invested in about 15 LLCs and they're spitting out a nice passive income for you. But you haven't explained where did you get the money to invest in those 50 LLCs. Yeah, so, and I wasn't sure if I mentioned the beginning or not. And by the way, I've actually invested in over 50 LLCs, just how many I'm currently invested in, because, you know, some of them exit over time. So um, I actually, in 2002, when I started going down the path of researching real estate and cash flow in general, I decided that cash flow was the perfect thing for me because of the predictability. So most of the stuff that I invest in is maybe 85, 90%, 100% occupied, stabilized, and it's honestly going in at a minimum of 9% cash flow right away. That's what I personally target for my own targets. And so once I started to dabble in, in um, the syndications and try them, I eventually said, you know, I'm just going to rotate all my money out of stocks and bonds into cash flow. And um, I don't want the conversation to get that much more complicated, but what I did actually to get out of the corporate world was do a mix of what I call amortized and non-amortized opportunities, meaning um, um, Non-amortized would be something just paying you a simple interest rate, but that there's always an underlying value to the asset. So if you invest in an apartment building and it's 100% occupied and you get 10% cash flow, and you go sell the building, you're going to have, you're going to get this 10% cash flow each year, but when you're going to go sell the building, you'll hopefully get your equity back or maybe even a profit, we'll see. Um, when you invest in something that's fully amortized, like a note, for example, um, like when you're paying off your home loan in 30 years and the bank gets your last payment, they're not getting any money at the end. There's no balloon payment. So when you've gotten all your money back from an amortized investment, you're done, but the cash on cash return, the cash flow is actually higher each year because it's a component of paying down the principal and the interest. And so what I did was I actually did a combination of amortized investments and non-amortized investments. Another a good example of a non a full amortized investment is um, I have a bunch of ATM machines. I have like 30 ATM machines I've invested in. And they average out, they've averaged about 40% per year for the past, I don't know, since 2000 and uh, eight, early 2008. And so that sounds great, right? But the truth is, is that I don't know what they're going to be worth 
when the investment ends and I have to go sell the machine, maybe it'd be worth 10% of what I invested in them, you know, the, the machine's gonna depreciate. So there's a very high cash, heavy cash on cash component, but it's a bit of a, a tricky situation because I might just get 10% of my money back at the end. So you have to be very careful with amortized investments, but I actually did a mix and I eventually transitioned into more uh, uh, non-amortized, because so they're, they're amortized is dangerous, right? Because if you go and invest in, in something that's fully amortized and it pays off in three years, at the end of three years you got nothing left. So if you didn't earn other money in the meantime and you just spent all of it, you've got nothing left. Um, but having a certain blend of it can really supercharge your cash flow if you do it very carefully. So that's really what I did. That's, didn't mean to make it too complicated, but. And I, I now have all my money in cash flow opportunities. It's somewhat e-liquid, but I live off the cash flow, reinvest the difference, and it took me a long time to make the transition, but I've got nothing in stocks and bonds, so. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I can give you all kinds of examples. So. Um, the longest term cash flow opportunity I can think of right now that just comes to mind is like investing in an oil field that's been pumping oil for five years so that you have some proof of it and it's maybe gonna go on for 50 years. And I actually know people who have been in these deals for decades. Okay, I actually, I was in one oil deal once, I'm not in one right now, I'm trying to get into another one. But that's the longest term I could think of. But otherwise when I invest in something, very long term would be more than 10 years. Most of the stuff I invest in probably has about a 10 year term. But then again, you've got like, you can do hard money, which is the short term loans against single family Phillips. That could be six months. Um, my ATM machines, they may have a longevity of like eight to 10 years and eventually they're just gonna be so crapped out as far as replacing parts that it just, they'll be dead. Um, you know, some operators will like, you know, some operators will hold a property for five to 10 years, then they're gonna wanna sell it. Some of them are even shorter term depending on the strategy they're taking. So essentially, if you've been doing this long enough, everything is going to have turned over almost. So that's why you're constantly having to find new opportunities to reinvest in. And most of the time when it's a passive investment, if it's a syndication, when you're setting up the legal <laughs> documents for the syndication, the lawyers especially want to make sure you've got time frames in there. This isn't a perpetual investment because the goal is to be getting investors their money back and so there's time frames that are laid out. So a lot of the times you're going to see, like Jeremy mentioned, three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years explicitly defined in the legal structure because that's what they're targeting. Um, well, when we set up the documents, we're telling investors what it is that we're trying to do, and we're giving them a time frame involved. So we could set it up that way if we wanted to, but you know, usually, you know, like the way we look at it is that you know, people are making decisions now to invest their money, and at some point, they they want their money back, even if it's making a good return. We want to make sure they have that option that if they want to reinvest with us, great, they can invest in something we've got going on. But if they need that capital for something else they should have, be able to have that access to do it. So we could, and it doesn't mean we wouldn't at some point set up something like that, but in general, they have very specific kind of time frames that we're targeting to, to get out of. Yeah, and just, just to let you know, I mean, the longest, I look at a lot of deals, because I'm actually on the investment committee for Realty Mogul, I've been looking at deals for myself for years, and it's, up, it's what I do full time. The longest fund I've ever seen was 50 years. And when I saw that number, I was literally saw it in the first three pages or something, and I just threw it in the garbage, because, you know, Florida is gonna be underwater for 40 years, right? <laughs> we all laugh, but it's actually unfortunately true. So, you know, you have to think ahead when you're a passive investor like this, and so I, most of the investors I talk to will not consider something that's beyond 10 years just because of the illiquidity and the nature of the fact they don't know what, what's gonna be going on that far out. But so. your, your question is a really important one because, you know, if you, when you're evaluating or looking to get into any type of passive investment, you know, besides, yeah, you want to make sure the, earlier I talked about your goals and what you're shooting for and your needs and that liquidity that Jeremy's talking about, that's all, how long can your money be tied up? How long do you want it to be tied up? And when, so when you're looking at all these different investments, you need a clear idea, idea in your head for this money, is this money that in six months I need to do something else or a year, I'm going to buy a house in two years. Well, then you don't want to get into something where the operators have said, this is a five to seven year type of deal. But if this is money where you're like, no, I want long-term cash flow, I want long-term wealth, then you might be looking for something that has that longer time frame as opposed to something that's going to be done in a year, which then you have to find something else to go into. So it all kind of gets back to, do you know what you want to do with that capital and finding the right opportunities to match what you want to do with it. Yeah, I just, I just want to add, one of the biggest disadvantages of investing the way that I do is the illiquidity. 
so I can't go on a screen and press sell and get my money three days later. And just to, to point out you know, even further what Eric was saying, it's actually illegal to sell your shares for the most part in, in an LLC opportunity you invest in as a passive investor for the first year. The SEC actually doesn't allow it. So you know, that's why it's even more important to really know what you're getting into and make sure it's not money you're gonna acquire from a liquidity perspective. Um, and if you're not the type of person who's comfortable, let's say going into a deal for more than a year, two years, five years, you gotta make sure it matches up because you're gonna be locked in. And it, it, in fact- It's, it's a marriage, it, that's yeah. the way we look at it. And, so. and, and <laughs> most of the documents that I read when I'm reviewing an opportunity to invest in the legal documents, um, even selling could be like a first right refusal for 30 days to the operator, then the second right refusal to the current investors, and then if, even if you have someone who wants to buy your shares, it could take a month until you actually get to the point where they're allowed to. Um, so that's what's one big downside of investing more passively. All right, one more. So we talked a lot about accredited investors, which we're looking at certain requirements, people that have their own um, cash flow already, their work, or whatever it is. But what about people that don't? I mean, I don't know if it's a personal question, but for you, at least, Jeremy, did you start out as an accredited investor, or did you start as a non accredited investor? Yeah, so, so the question is about non-accredited investors. Did I personally start out as an accredited investor? I actually am not even 100% sure at this point, but um, it was, um, I'm not sure. It was borderline, I think, because I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but I will tell you that the vast majority of the opportunities I invest in are for accredited and what they call sophisticated investors, which is essentially non-accredited investors who have some type of experience and background, either in real estate or what they're investing in or investing in these types of opportunities but are not necessarily accredited. Yeah. So. And that's why it's important to learn a lot about you know, these structures that we're talking about or the, the syndications where money's being pooled. And you know, uh, Rishi was talking about the Jobs Act and changes that have happened. And that's why it's imp you're going to start to see a lot more of these opportunities structured this way. And you have to, it's a good idea to start to learn the differences in the structures because there's a certain type of Reg D offering that allows you to advertise, allows you to solicit, but you can only do it for accredited investors. Then there's the older type, but still people are doing that because the advantage is that you can have up to 35 non-accredited but sophisticated investors. So depending on what your, your status is, that's one of the first questions you want to ask before you spend time going through everything. What structure is that set up? So far, there's been a lot of hypotheticals about you know, like, what you want to watch out for. So, but for me, it's not, you know, I'm looking at someone in the down equity. And if I'm interested in passive investment, is that even feasible? You know what I mean? Is that even worth my time? Okay. So, but mean, worth, worth your time in what sense? Well, I mean, for me, like, I just graduated law school. So for me, like, Congratulations. I don't have a job. <laughs> I guess, anyway, so, uh, so, so for me, you know, I'm making a choice, you know, active passive, you know, like, do I try to make my job, do I just get home to dad, and do this, you know, um, is this something I can do a mix of passive and active, you know, is it pretty much, you know, like, if my job is like too much of my efforts, or should I just do one or the other? So really what it comes down to is, like, for, I guess, for you guys, like, for me, you know, so, I mean, I have a house right now. I have a few good ideas right now. But, you know, is that work? Is it passive investing? Should I grab people? Is that the minimum? I mean, like, what's the entry barrier? So, from a from a pure dollar amount, the entry barriers, I mean, Jeremy's, they're all over the place. I mean, I've seen some as low as a few thousand dollars. Typically, you're looking at 25 or 40s, that type of a range. Some are a lot higher. Some are in the, you know, half a million dollars, million dollar range. But there's a wide spectrum of it. But, you know, the way you're phrasing your question, honestly, it still gets back to what do you want to do? And I know it's not, and it's not a cop out, but it honestly, yeah. Yeah, are there, genuinely there are genuinely opportunities in that range, and it, but it does boil down to how, you know, I kind of look at it as three things. It's how much time do you have, what's your education level, and how much money do you have? And those three things, to me, ultimately go into that decision of do you want to be passive, do you want to be active, or do you want to be both? And it's if, if you have, if you're busy, if you're, you're a lawyer now and you want to, you love that, that's your passion, and you want to be doing that all day long, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. You have to be doing that all day long. Um, then you maybe don't have the time, so you are going to look more passive. Or you know, again, maybe you really like some sort of a, of a, of a space, or some sort of an asset class, but you don't have the skills. And maybe you want to get in passively to, to start to learn that, to learn more about that space. Or you know, so there's lots of different reasons that go behind it. And I don't mean to keep copying out. It depends what you want. But that's the honestly to me. Before anything else, you take that time to sit down and say, what is it that I really want to do? And then coming to meetings like this, this is, you know, like I said, it's, 
when you come to meetings like this, you get to meet so many different people and take your time and talk to different people, find out what they're doing, find out what they did, and then you can just kind of say, okay, how does this fit in? And you're just going to start to, to learn more and more about different type of opportunities that are out there and be able to fit that to what you've decided you want to do. Yeah, just, just to give you some concrete data. So most of the investments that I invest in I, that I see are typically minimum 25 or 50,000, more commonly even 25. Um, that's on the non-crowdfunding side. On the crowdfunding side, um, you guys, you guys, we've got as low as five, five or ten. Five, yeah, yeah, five thousand. So, but you have to be accredited, but they can go down as low as five thousand. I'm not sure about the other sites. So, there, you know, but but it's funny because I was giving the exact same answer as Eric, which is, you know, even if you're not sure either way, or even if you're, you think that you have, you need more money before you start with, to be comfortable. I would strongly recommend that you, kind of learn as much as you can and the way that I learn is actually through opportunity exposure because yeah. I'm not familiar with any book that tells you how to analyze a deal as an investor <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I've been trying to put a course together for like four years but I've just too, been too busy investing but really I think there, you know, opportunity exposure can be a great thing so you should take a look and read as many opportunities as you can and when the time comes it could be in a year or two, five years, you'd be very well educated at that point to know what you should invest in. And if he does write the book, buy it because he's one of the most detailed <laughs> question asking people you will ever come across. But that's a good thing because you know he's gonna dig in and know every single nuance of a deal and that's what you want. And it honestly is experience. Just look at as many as you can and, and do that. And real quick on that, that's one of the advantages of these crowdfunding sites is those lower minimums. So if they work with an, an operator that normally has you know, $200,000 minimum, but then they're able to come in and say, hey, we're only doing five or $10,000 minimums, that gives access to a lot. Because there's still a lot of accredited investors that don't want to put 100,000, 200,000, half million dollars into a deal, and they'd rather put it into a lot of smaller ones. And so crowdfunding sites is a way of, of being able to do that and get in at a lot lower amount. Not always, but there's definitely it's, a lot of cases. It's also where that's the case. diversification as well. Right. I just want to, again, refer to the disclosure slide that was on at the beginning. We are not offering investment advice no, here, no, no. But, but, but certainly, I mean, Every person's portfolio is based on the risk that they're willing to take. Yep. So while some folks want cash flowing investments, I personally am less, uh, am more risk averse and I'm willing to go out and invest in more development type deals on my personal account. And that is sort of back ending cash flows, but I want to marry that with some cash flowing assets so you have just a base amount of capital that's turning over every month or quarter or year. So everyone has to look at what risks they can tolerate and, and what cash flow they can outlay and then, you know, the receipt of that income over time. Absolutely, because development's not risk averse for me. That's, oh, that's, sorry, that's really? high risk. So. <laughs> There's a hand that's been up there for like five minutes. I feel bad for him. So <laughs> I want to see how long right. he can hold it up, actually. I think we should just wait and see. Yeah. Right. Am, I, am I understanding correctly then when we're putting up to 99 investors, this is without a PPM? Is that correct? Or do I need to put a PPM in place? There is absolutely a PPM in place. I mean, that, that is the Reg D 506B and 506C. We, th that is a private placement through a private placement memo. Yeah, you have to anytime, and that's you know, the definition of a security, as far the loose definition as far as the SEC is concerned, is anytime anybody's investing, investing money on anybody's behalf, it's a security. Anytime you pool money, it's a security. You have to have a PPM structure in place for that. You said we can raise up to how much? Is there a limit? Uh, for, for private placements, there is not a limit. Ryan, did you have a question? Yeah, how do, do the terms or opportunities or uh, you talk about well, it depends on how you how you set up the syndication. So, if you were to, you know, let's say you're single family homes or your apartments, whatever it is, and you want to go create your syndication, when you're creating those documents and that private placement memorandum, you're putting what you want. And so you decide how you want to structure that, whether it's minimums are different, whether the returns are different based on when people get in. There's a ton of different ways that you can do it. The simpler, the better, from, from what I can see, but that's up to you if you're the operator to decide what you want to do. But from the investor side, how do, are there different terms or I think you're t for a particular investment, if you're a larger investor versus a smaller investor, there's no discrimination in your terms. Um, but from investment to investment, two different deals, there could absolutely be different parameters for that. Yeah. So Does that make sense? Yeah. And just a couple of other points. So I actually have seen a few deals, not often, that did have different classes of shares depending on how much you're going to invest. And some of them are more favorable than others, but it's, I don't see that often. Um, 
I will say though that there is a difference uh, between what I call a non-institutional deal and institutional deal. So an institutional deal is something like a pension fund or a very high net worth person would be looking to invest in. Typically a minimum might be a million dollars. Um, and those can be structured a little differently. Um, the non-institutional investors, which I imagine is most of us in the room, um, those are structured more like what you see that I invested in and more Realty Mogul offers and the type of structure that Eric uses. Um, so that, there is a bit of a difference depending on how big you are. I actually prefer the structure that um, non-institutional investors get, believe it or not. The institutional investors are exposed more to what I call Wall Street terms, which is a certain percent, pe percentage of assets under management regardless of the performance of the, of the opportunity. They get paid every quarter. So it's kind of more of the same on the bigger investors. And that's actually one of the things I really like about the structures of typical syndications on the non-institutional side. But just adding one thing to that, Jeremy, I mean, if, if there are different return hurdles for different investor si investors within the same LLC, that, that's got to be fully disclosed. I mean, that, that's something that's fully disclosed to each investor within that LLC. So you know if you're going in with inferior terms. All right, Imran. I just thought maybe you guys could touch a little bit on what a PTM actually is. Yeah, sure. PPM is sim quite simply a private placement memo, and it's a it's a business plan, and it outlines the the terms of the deal. It will outline the amount of capital being raised, and it will outline what what the capital is being used for. It will outline the the management team and their experience. It's basically your business plan for that particular investment. Why do we need one? <clears throat> because people who are investing in that in that and that's governed by the SEC, they need to know where their money is going. Correct. If you're going to raise money, talk to a syndication attorney. Yeah. Bottom line, yeah, that's all. Yeah. That's all you got to know. <laughs> yeah, none of us are attorneys, so that's yeah, part of the problem. Not at all. Yeah. Here's what I will tell you as an investor. Okay, if you have a PPM involved in, in, in an opportunity, then you really should read all of it. it. One of the most important things that a PPM does is actually outline the risks. There's typically multiple, multiple, multiple pages of risks that are outlined by the operator to protect themselves, and um, and then. Typically, if you're going to invest in something that has a PPM, and it's normally there's an LLC that goes with it, which is the operating agreement, which for those of you who are not familiar, the operating agreement literally dictates the rules of how the company is run. And it's ultra important. And I can't tell you how many times I look at an opportunity, and there's either some crazy thing in the operating agreement, or there is actually, I, I, am, I'm in a bit, I have my own investor group, so I'm able to go and actually negotiate and structure opportunities. So it's a little bit different for me, and I'm used to looking at the fine print because of it. But make sure you read the operating agreement and the PPM and both of them. There is like crazy stuff I have seen. I have, I, yeah, there are just like cash call stuff that where they force you to put money in or they, they dilute you and just all these important things. So just be very careful. Make sure you read all the documents. So I'm wondering how does Realty Mogul make money? How does Realty Mo Mogul make money? That's a very good question. So again, we are, we, we raise debt for borrowers who are looking to borrow money and when we issue a loan we make an origination fee um, that we charge the borrower for issuing that loan and that's typically a percentage or two on the the loan amount and then to the ultimate investor we will charge them a servicing fee because uh, you know we deal with the capital that comes in the interest payment that comes in we take that divvy it up in sort of ratable portions and distribute it out to each of the individual investors will issue you a 1099 at the end of each year so for for that service and technology fee we charge a you know what we call a servicing fee so that's on the debt side um, on the equity side uh, we'll charge a sponsor a placement fee which is again a percentage on the capital raised for them uh, we will again charge the investor what's called a servicing fee and in some instances um, we will take a piece of the sponsors what, what what's called a promote which is the their incentive fee if the if the project performs will take a small piece of that as well in some instances. Okay. One more. Uh, just specific to Realty Mogul, and I understand that every deal is going to be different, but what is generally an average timeline between a sponsor brings you a deal, you do your due diligence, and then take it out and get the investor capital raised? So I know it's just you know, what's an average thing. Sure, I mean, I think. So on the equity side, if a sponsor is trying to raise equity, I mean, the first thing we want to do is we're going to underwrite the sponsor. Um, so we want to make sure, you know, if, if, if there's been a bankruptcy attached to your name, you know, chances are you, it's, it's been challenging to manage your own money. So 
you know, we would question internally whether that was something we would want to expose others to. Um, again, it would be fully disclosed, so, uh, but that's, that's, that's a question we'd ask. We, we typically look at your background, your criminal record, um, and, but, but assuming we get comfortable with the sponsor, that, that process can take anywhere from, you know, 10 to 15 days. Um, then we also simultaneously are looking at the deal. Uh, the deal has to have certain characteristics. Again, you know, what we found is accredited investors are, are, are very much cash flow investors, so they want current cash. Um, you know, they don't want an asset that's too heavily levered. Um, so, you know, we, we make sure that the asset, the, the profile of the asset and the parameters of that asset um, meet what our client base wants to buy. Um, and that process will take about another 10 to 15 days and, you know, it'll go on our site and allocations will get filled. Does that answer your question? That does, that's pretty quick. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah. Eager. Okay. Question asker. Then. <laughs> Go for it. You don't get paid until you actually install When we, we raise the capital, that's correct. Um, if somebody has a shopping mall that they want to raise money for, how involved would you guys be in that? So I, I, I guess I'd need a little bit more. I hate to I hate to punt on the matter, but if someone's raising money for a deal that they, I mean, typically we won't really work with someone unless they have a deal tied up. Um, just because you know a lot of people want to try real estate and, and taking a step back I mean you know we're a platform to pair accredited investors to experienced sponsors you know just the whole concept of being online I, I, I don't want to um, set the illusion that this is a sort of forum for everyone to give real estate a try that's not what we're trying that's not the message we're trying to send we're trying to get accredited and investors tied to experienced sponsors to engage with one another and, and invest in real estate in a way that, that otherwise didn't exist. Um, so, you know, talking about your friend's retail center, you know, if that was something they had tied up, they had a business plan, they had some portion of, you know, the capital stack raised, if they had a term sheet for the debt and they were trying to raise the equity, you know, we'd look at that um, and, and that would sort of fall under the same timelines that I gave the gentleman over here. You know, we, we, it would be a 30 day process to get on our platform and then however long it took to raise the capital. It's a good thing I actually mentioned the question piece because definitely a lot of questions. There's a few more questions. Yeah. Uh, right here. Um, so I know it's a new platform, a new vehicle, but compared to uh, what you've seen in the traditional market, and you can hear me to um, how, um, how profitable are the deals that you're seeing on the Are they you know, superior because of the scalability of it? Are they you know, uh, uh, inferior because of yeah, let me, so I can answer that. So you have to understand that when you invest with Realty Mogul, they're doing all the work of finding the deal, vetting the operator, doing the background check, trying to be sure that you're getting into something they pre-vetted, and they're going to get paid for that. So I've actually co-invested in opportunities where I've actually invested in an opportunity myself, and that they've actually co-invested with the exact same sponsor. But I invested directly with the sponsor, and they got investors pulled together in their entity and invested in that deal. And my return is going to be higher because they have their set associated fees because they're actually get they have to get credit for finding the operator. So if so, you can either go at it directly and try and find the operator. That's what I do, and so my return is going to be slightly higher. Or you can just basically log onto the site, and they have a slew of opportunities you can invest in. And that's just a philosophical question. Um, it's hard for me to necessarily describe the spreads. I don't know if you have an opinion on that. No, I mean, every, every deal is different. Every single deal we underwrite is different. I mean, I'd say for every hundred deals we underwrite, we maybe think seven of them are, 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 are worthwhile to pursue. And then after we go through our diligence on the sponsor and then the asset and the capitalization of it, we maybe work with one or two of them. So we see a number of deals and we have to vet a number of them. Um, but that, but that's a, it's a very, I mean, the real estate investment market's very dynamic. I mean, returns change. I mean, if you've heard, you're probably familiar with the term cap rates. I mean, cap rates 
are fairly volatile depending on capital costs from Wall Street and the capital markets. Um, so, you know, we're very dynamic and we're, we're constantly talking to all the intermediaries and folks involved in deals so that we're, we're, we're pricing stuff appropriately. We are not a cheaper cost of capital for a sponsor. We are offering just accredited investors access to these deals whereby they otherwise would not have access to them. Right. You're referring to averages there um, in timeline. You didn't indicate how long it usually takes to that's that's a fair question so I'll give you one example. For one sponsor, a fix and flip investor um, who had never missed a late payment and had you know made the balloon payment at the end, at the maturity of the loan, they came and put their third um, asset on our platform for a debt allocation and that allocation was filled in 22 minutes. Um, so speed is our value proposition right now. Um, you know, we, 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 again, we're dynamic and we find voids in the capital stack where, you know, traditional capital sources aren't flowing to right now. I mean, I think a lot of folks are hard money lenders here. I think hard money lenders, there's, there's, there's not a lot of traditional banks or financial institutions that lend um, short-term durations for sort of the, 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 the types of project that fix and flippers and hard money lenders are lending for. So we're, we're, having, we're gaining an, uh, an immense amount of traction with hard money lending. Um, so that's, that's, that's really the flavor of the month right now. And, and what's the average size of, of uh, raise? <clears throat> so again, the JOBS Act passed in April 2012 and, and, and 506C, so general solicitation was really promulgated by the SEC in September 2013. So September 2013 to now is what, eight, nine months? So in those eight, nine months, we've raised about 20 million and our, our, our sweet spot for each individual deal is anywhere from 500,000 to 3 million. And we are seeing that grow on a monthly basis just because people are getting more and more receptive to the idea of investing in uh, a real estate allocation online. Who is the general partner? Or is there a general partner per se, say, versus uh, who the partner? Is that type of or no? Sure. So, I mean, just a typical structure in a joint venture. There's an operator. So, Eric is an operator in one of our uh, in one of our deals, and he is the general partner of the venture. Um, we subsequently set up a special purpose entity, which we raise capital for from up to 100 investors. Um, <clears throat> we bring those investors in, you know, I will negotiate a joint, that joint venture agreement directly with Eric. You know, my company, Realty Mogul, will retain managing member rights of that SPE. So each individual investor within that SPE does not have the right to go and talk to Eric. He talks to me and I deal with the remaining investors. So that shores up a lot of his time to focus on mobile home parks and subsequently enables me to sort of, you know, carve out a piece of that flow, of that process flow. Correct. Oh, good. So, Jeremy, earlier you'd mentioned uh, having control over, uh, handing control over to an operator. And Rishi, you expressed uh, how investing passively allows an investor to have control over their own portfolio. Uh, can each of you talk about control and op the operator's role? Sure. Um, you know, I think going back to the, the, the you have control over your portfolio. Um, investing in a, in a blind pool fund of Eric's, my money's going into mobile home parks, and, and, and I know that. So I can invest some portion into his fund, but then I can subsequently also invest another portion into a multifamily product some portion into an office project. So I can diversify my portfolio that way as opposed to traditional routes of you know, investing in a blind pool fund or a REIT where you're really giving them the money and they're taking their money and employing it you know, pursuant to their strategy and business plan. This just enables you the ability to fine tune on more of a micro level and, and really create your own portfolio that way. Yeah, and, and from my perspective as an investor, um, Control is probably the single most important thing. If you're considering going down this path, you have to be 100% comfortable giving control up. Not everybody is. Um, I've talked to many people over the years who just aren't. And if you're used to owning a single family property, you like being able to sell it whenever you want or change the manager up um, or refi it whenever you want, you know, this may or may not be the right path for you. Um, Again, the advantage, in my perspective, the biggest advantage is diversification, which is I have, I mean, I am invested in, I could, any of the asset class I could think of except for um, self-assisted uh, living. I just haven't invested in it yet. But like I'm investing in mobile home parks, self-storage, hard money loans, notes, 
uh, office, industrial, retail. Um, that's just uh, on the on the invest on the real estate side, and some other stuff like ATM machines, cash flowing websites, addition short term uh, loans to companies, kind of like um, ones that are backed by real estate, but actual business assets. They do all kinds of stuff, and there's no way I could do all that without going passive and giving up control. But the cool thing about giving up control um, is that I'm always making a bet on a really experienced operator. So Eric and his partners, just because he's here, um, you know, they own about $250 million worth of mobile home assets. And I don't know the first thing about buying a mobile home park. I really don't. Um, and so for me, I'm happy to make the bet on Eric and his team after doing my due diligence that you know that, that they're going to do a good job. Now I don't have any control over doing it with my money. Um, I am definitely there's always a fraud risk when you're giving up control. There's like the, what I call a one percent risk, where there's an operational risk. There's all types of risks you do not have control over. Um, so just be very very careful and consider that point if you're considering going down the path. I I am you know my goal in life now besides not going back to the corporate world is sleep, going to sleep tonight, waking up tomorrow, and not much has changed. That's really what I care about, because that means my cash flow is going to come in. It's true. That means the cash flow is going to come in, and that's why I like investing in higher occupied type um, scenarios. But I am giving up control, and there is risk associated with giving up control. All right. All right. So this could, oh, go, go for it. Um, when you're investing in a, let's say, a flying tool, what are you expecting, or what's the legal requirement for that operator to be reported to the quality yeah, and I will say, like, so for those of you who are familiar, a blind pool is, or a semi-blind pool, is when you're investing in a fund that has a number of assets. So instead of saying, you're going to buy this apartment building, it's going to close tomorrow, and that's what you're investing in, it's like Eric goes out and buys multiple um, the parks in a fund, and that's you're investing across multiple parks. And depending on when you invest in, when the funds open, you may know some of what he's investing in, some of what not he may not be investing in, but in the future.